Nice. All right. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, I have a little agenda. Um, I will introduce myself and the company, and uh, then I will present our migration case, uh, because how we got to Istio is kind of part how, of how we uh, architected our solution. And uh, yeah, uh, let's get right into it, uh, because there are a bunch of slides, and uh, well, let's uh, hope that we make it in time. So a uh, little bit about me. I've been at uh, Wicom for quite a while, in tech quite a while. I've done uh, pretty much everything from hardware to software engineering to architecture, uh, mostly just as a growth path. At some point, I noticed that the DevOps stuff and the microservice architecture is the most interesting for me, so stuck with that, and then started doing that at Wecamp. Now, Wecamp itself is probably not very well known outside of the Netherlands. That's because we are a, essentially a digital department store in the Netherlands. So unless you're here, well, you probably haven't bought anything from us. Um, this slide I stole from Corporate Deck just to give you an idea of what the size of the uh, company is. Uh, so we're not that big, however, for the Netherlands, we're doing okay. Now, we also have um, uh, some things that are not on the slide, such as uh, our own uh, data centers embedded in our uh, warehouse. Uh, we're also in the cloud. Um, we do have actually our own warehouse. Uh, we have our own software engineering teams and our own platform teams. So that's, uh, as far as I've heard, somewhat unusual for a company that's not super big. Uh, we have been around for a while, about 70 years, uh, which means that we also have a bunch of legacy. Now, this is what you usually see as an outside customer looking in, a bunch of catalogs, and then at some point a website. Uh, however, if we uh, cut this down to two phases, you have the phase where there's no technology, like in the 50s, I mean, there's no Istio in the 50s. There's just uh, paper and phones and Rolodexes. Um, at some point, your business grows, and then you end up with these, which are punch cards, which go into mainframes. And at that point, you are essentially forever stuck in upgrading from one legacy to another, because what's cool today is going to be legacy tomorrow. Now, our legacy that we are dealing with is going from Mesos to uh, Kubernetes. And on Mesos, we had this super duper custom traffic solution. And on, uh, 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 because Mesos, well, back when it was created, there wasn't really any cool do everything traffic solution. And in Kubernetes, there is, which is Istio. Now, how did we, uh, 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 decide to go for Istio, uh, that, that's somewhat interesting. Um, if you look at the, the, the age and the problems that we have um, in the new platform, we didn't want to have those problems. Uh, so that means that the custom work for traffic, like server discovery and routing and balancing and figuring out who should talk to who, that is something that we didn't want to do custom anymore because A, it's not necessary, and B, we have only three people working on this, including me. So, uh, so right now there's two people working on it, uh, which means that um, the more, is, uh, the more capable the system is, the better for us. So uh, there's also a little bit of an extension, like a slight Kubernetes tentacle that goes into the warehouse. So uh, some of the warehouse systems, as you know, uh, they are operational technologies like uh, PLCs and uh, robotic packing machines. Uh, they are very latency sensitive, so you can't really run your robotics software in the cloud and then your robotics machine in the building because, well, the cloud is in Ireland, so not great. So uh, that means that our traffic uh, also needs at some point, luckily for us, not right now, but at some point it needs to understand uh, uh, how to get things that are in the cloud to talk to things that are not in the cloud. Now, where do we come from? Because that is uh, 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 a, a, a very, well, not necessarily impactful, very strong driver as to what features we definitely need. Um, it's uh, essentially a platform that allows a developer to do lots of things uh, automatically, self-serve. And that also means that for us to enable that, we have to make sure that the facilities that do that exist. Now, those same facilities, they will all be in the destination architecture. Um, for traffic, uh, those facilities look like this. So you have your browser, you go into Cloudflare, you then get into your load balancer at AWS, and that sends your traffic into OpenResty, which is mostly Nginx plus Lua. And that does a bunch of uh, thinking about where does the URL uh, actually point to, which microservice, and it does things like authentication. So that needs to be happening at what in Istio is called your ingress gateway. Now, uh, for a developer, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter what the implementation is. So we can use Istio, but as long as they just say, hey, I would like to receive some traffic, I would like to get something, uh, as long as that keeps happening, it doesn't really matter what we use. So for us, that means that if someone says, well, Istio, that sounds very complicated. Maybe, but as long as you don't have any like, like direct interaction with it, 
you shouldn't really have any problems with it. So what happens is that your uh, uh, typical developer workflow is you push some code to a repository, it builds an image, and the image gets deployed, and at some point you will have your URL where you can reach your microservice that is running based on that Docker image that you published. Now, what do developers do when they want to tell the system how they want to have their microservice behave? Well, they use a very long Docker label string, uh, which if you break it up in a few lines, it looks very readable. But uh, in reality, uh, this is not very readable because it becomes one very big line that you have to you do custom parsing for and then figure out how to convert these flags into actual settings for, say, Nginx or HAProxy. Now, if you uh, also take into account what people have to do to reconfigure their service, uh, it's in a Docker file, which means that the only way to update it is to build a new image and redeploy, which means if you want to make a configuration change, you now have version version 1.1.1.1.1 because, well, you need to do have this slight configuration change and the only way to get that into your platform is to reconfigure the entire service and redeploy it. So, not great. Now, what we want to do is to keep these features. So, some of them are somewhat weak because they're not very secure. There's no MTLS in Mesos. Um, but we want to at least give them the sense that the ease of deployment and the ease of receiving traffic remains the same, which means that this part the part where your traffic gets in and somehow ends up at your microservice, that needs to be, well, nearly identical in Istio. Which also means that the authentication part, which is somewhat tricky because it's entirely custom, also needs to be transplanted to Istio. Because what's the point of using Istio if you're using Istio plus all your legacy stuff? You know, we really want to get rid of it. We don't have the manpower to support it. So uh, that needs to be uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, maintained and, and, and kept as a feature. And then we also have the service discovery part. So we're currently using HAProxy in conjunction with console, uh, which kind of works, but it breaks more often than you would think. Uh, so that's not great. Um, but luckily for us, that's a problem that is like super duper solved because Kubernetes does your, uh, your service catalog automatically. You don't actually need to do anything for that. It just happens. And uh, even if you weren't using Istio, I think Kubeproxy also does a decent job to at least get traffic to your container. But this is nice because by default, you get Istio, it works. Great. Now, this part, uh, there is a, in your Docker file, there is an ID which is uh, used to generate internal URLs for your service, which then get load balanced across all your instances. Um, and one of the developers were like, well, it's going to be a pain in the ass because we changed uh, to Istio, which means we also changed all of your URLs, which is partially true. But if you look at the pain of rewriting all your services because your traffic mesh is now super duper different, uh, that would be a much bigger pain. So we're like, well, this is a little bit of pain. We can deal with that. And if everyone agrees that that's something that we're willing to deal with, we can continue and migrate. So from this source architecture, we did this whole analysis ahead of time. So we knew that after the fact, no one's going to complain like, oh, well, you switched to Istio and now your service is broken. No, you knew this ahead of time. So informed people tend to be a lot happier with the migration. Which uh, brings us to the last part of the legacy system. So uh, in your Docker file, you, uh, we have three different flavors of traffic that you can uh, receive. So you have uh, consumer traffic, which is your public website and your mobile app. You have third party traffic, which is mostly business to business traffic. Like uh, if we order a bunch of shoes, then the supplier might say, hey, I've got a bunch of pictures to send you. And we do it in an automated fashion. So we need an endpoint to upload those pictures to, which means third party traffic. And we have trusted traffic, which is not actually trusted, um, but uh, someone, I think 15 years ago, thought it was a great idea to call it trusted, which is essentially the opposite of zero trust, because it's implicitly trusted traffic, which I didn't agree with, but you know, keeping it easy for everyone to use means we also have to keep using this label for trusted traffic. But what you do is you essentially have a Boolean, you set it to true or false, and your service uh, will uh, uh, receive that traffic based on what you configured. Now. How do we do that in our destination architecture? Because we need to keep the same, uh, the same developer comforts, um, but we don't want to do it using legacy systems. So we take the, the ingredients that we have in our old system and we somehow translate them into new ingredients. Uh, and I'm calling them ingredients because you might usually have a long track where you do uh, research in uh, oh, what are the functional requirements and what are the technical requirements and we're going to try all of these things and we're going to fly in an army of consultants. But uh, we don't have that money and we don't have the people. So we were just like, well, how can we make a list that at least looks like we can match it to something on the very familiar uh, cloud native landscape? Now, 
if I present this, uh, the first time I presented this to people inside the company, they were very scared because they were like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? Uh, which kind of makes sense because if you look at it and you don't know what it is, you're like, well, I can't do anything with this. Uh, but um, uh, the, the nice thing about it, it, it's categorized. So you can just pick a small portion of the entire landscape and only use that portion. So, uh, well, we already knew it has to be traffic. So we just took all the traffic stuff that's in there. We all grabbed a few and we just tried them out. So a lot of them, including Istio, have uh, cool documentation pages, demo pages, uh, applications you can try out immediately. You can do it locally. You don't even need to buy a cluster or rent a cluster somewhere. So you just use this, uh, this never ending cycle a couple of times until you're comfortable with one of them. Um, and this doesn't take any additional manpower or additional money. All it takes is time. And that's something that we had. So, you know, use what you have. So at uh, that point, we were comfortable with Istio. We had some idea of what to uh, build, what to use. Uh, so we came up with this very uh, large diagram. Now, don't worry about the diagram. I'm not going to talk an hour about what the diagram represents. We're just going to cut the top half off because that's essentially what's replicated in all the other halves. So in the middle, there are three streams of traffic flavors. That's essentially why so many of the boxes are duplicated. And there's the egress gateway, which is there because I insisted that we have it. Um, but everyone was very uh, angry that the services would no longer be able to talk to the outside world. So it's there, but it's not enforced. Um, but anyway, if we cut off the top part and we only look at uh, uh, the traffic path as we want to present it to developers, uh, we have our ingress, which is uh, an AWS ALB. Of course, Cloudflare sits in front of that, but it's not necessarily relevant. And we use this 2.2 and ingress. And why do we do that? Because the AWS load balancer controller does not support pointing to uh, something that is a node port um, because it, it, it will create a node network load balancer. And the downside of network load balancing is that you cannot use ACM, which is AWS's service for uh, certificates. So we really like that because it automates your renewal and does all the things for you. Very cool but uh, it only works with application load balancers and those only uh, work with ingresses. So that was a bit of a bummer um, because well, AWS didn't uh, notify us about this. So we were spending like a day trying to find out why we got the wrong load balancer all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, you sandwich an ingress in between and everything works great. Then we have your standard uh, combination uh, and you will find this in the docs uh, repeated many times. Uh, you've got your gateway definition and you've got your ingress gateway. Uh, so the ingress gateway uh, uh, and the uh, essentially this is the part where you have an envoy proxy that is configured to accept traffic from the outside world and it makes some uh, preliminary decisions like well is this a domain name that we actually know about and uh, do we want to pass this traffic to someone else you can you use label selectors in Kubernetes to make those choices so that's that part now the only thing that's not standard is that it has to be a node port type because what's the problem with an ingress? It only works with a node port type. So we have to chain three not super standard things together, but at least they're, the components themselves, they are standard. So that was a win for us. Um, we only do some configuration, which is fine compared to 20,000 lines of custom code. So then we tacked on a proxy WASM module, which is not necessarily advertised as being production ready, uh, but it worked great. Uh, didn't talk about that. Uh, um, at Reject, um, because even though it has some rough edges, this allows us to migrate to Istio. Because what is one of the problems, yeah, one of the slides a few uh, uh, minutes ago, is our authentication mechanism. It's non-standard. It uses a web token, which in theory can be handled by Istio, but in practice our tokens are broken, so Istio cannot handle them. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to make a filter, and the filter then handles our broken token. And then the traffic goes through the normal Envoy path and onto your service. So that solves that part for us. And then you need your virtual service because you might have per service preferences. For example, my service is only reachable on slash service slash basket, if you have your basket service. And you need to configure that somewhere. So we deploy with every service that a developer would want to deploy, we deploy a virtual service definition. And then using some flags in YAML, which I'll show in a bit, you can uh, configure as a developer, do I want this consumer traffic or not? Do I want this third party traffic or not? So you're not necessarily exposed to the inner workings, but we're using all the components as they were designed to be used, which for us is super great because this, this solves all of our problems without having to write all of this stuff ourselves. And then uh, at the very end, there's the service definition, which uh, uh, is used to find all the pods. Uh, so that's just a standard Kubernetes uh, resource. 
So these things, they're all uh, deployed uh, using GitOps, using Terraform, using Argo CD. So this whole uh, uh, traffic flow is, is made up of standard components, a little bit of custom configuration, and we essentially transferred the entire old traffic pattern onto Kubernetes, which was very great. For a developer, it means that you have this, uh, these very big letters, uh, which mean you can configure whatever you want using just Booleans, except there's this little bit at the bottom. So some of our services, they are, let's say, not of the level of quality that you would like them to be. Uh, so we want to prevent uh, any unsafe uh, request methods. So for example, a service that is supposed to only receive get methods because we know someone left some Java actuator open on the back door and that would be bad. So we want to filter those out. So how do you do that? Well, we deploy an authorization policy with every application as well, which means that we can now decide, well, if you are a developer and you are accepting, in this case, consumer traffic, and uh, your service is not super safe, uh, we will just deny every operation uh, that's not a GET. And this is also immediately making use of the spiffy identity. So the principle that's listed in this uh, element, uh, that's actually the service account identity, which is also the spiffy identity of the ingress gateway, which means that as soon as a request comes in, and it comes in using the consumer traffic flow, we get to apply this authorization policy to it and we get to deny it if it's not a GET request, which is all super great because this used to be, again, like 200 lines of custom Lua somewhere in a gateway that nobody maintains. And this is a well-supported resource that does exactly what you need, which was very great for us. Now, if you're using this, you might think, well, uh, how do you get to this stage? Well, if you look at the documentation and this graph isn't the highest uh, pixel density, um, but when you work with these authorization policies, you might think, well, how do they work? Uh, how do I make sure that I don't make a policy that accidentally blocks something else? Now, there are some guidelines in documentation uh, on the Istio website, which uh, says, uh, well, make sure that your, um, your ordering of rules, if you want to make safe authorization policies, are set to essentially fail safe. So if you make a mistake in your policy, it doesn't suddenly block everything, but it fails essentially open. Um, so uh, at least that's how I interpret it. But the documentation is very clear on suggestions, but also if you ignore the suggestions, it also works. Now, they also have this very cool uh, uh, diagram which shows you when something is um, uh, denied or allowed. And uh, for us, it means that if we only specify a deny policy, that means that if you go through the entire flow and it says, is there a custom policy applied? No. Is there a deny policy applied? Well, if it comes through trusted, then no. Is there an allow policy? Also no. So that means that we allow the request. So instead of having 20 policies that says, oh, we deny this and we allow that, you just define one, only the one that you need, and then everything else keeps working. So that's super great. Now, we do have a little bit of time because I raised the slides, because there might be something that is interesting uh, uh, for you guys. So we can do or QA and thing, like how do we package it? We can look at our Argo City instance so you can see how the Istio traffic is represented visually. Uh, or we could look at the system and the workload repositories that we use to segregate our Istio configuration that applies to the entire cluster, or the configuration that only applies to your service. Or we can look at the proxy wasm stuff, because that's somewhat cutting edge, but maybe someone's interested in that. Or if you want nothing, that's also fine, and we can just sit around. <laughs> Sounds like we have a request for the Argo CD topic. Yeah? All right. So. This is always, uh, of course, dangerous uh, because when you do a demonstration, uh, it means that uh, everything needs to work. But since we do still have, I think, five minutes, that should be uh, okay. So what I'm going to do is, I uh, mean, uh, let's end this presentation, let's see. And we can then enable screen mirroring because, you know, living on the edge, living dangerously. So we can mirror this. All right, is that big enough? Yeah, that's big enough. So, uh, of course, it's only exciting if you do it all very much in production. Uh, I actually have a picture that says we don't test on animals, we test in production. So, um, yeah, so let's uh, live on the edge. Let's go into the VPN and um, pick the Argosity thing. So, what we have is uh, we have multiple environments. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And we uh, essentially have two main uh, projects in our Argo CD configuration. And one project is responsible for the services that developers deploy. And another project is responsible for the things that we as a uh, platform team deploy. 
So if we look at, for example, our Istio stuff, so for example, we have the base, that is essentially the Helm chart that Istio provides for default installation. Uh, that lives in a GitHub repository, and ArgusD keeps that in sync, which means if we bump the version, we bump it in Git, everything gets upgraded. And usually when you do a minor version bump, it's painless, which is amazing. So we have a bunch of stuff in here that just uh, gives you all the resources that Istio needs, which I think if you've used Istio, you are somewhat familiar with. If you've not used Istio, uh, let's not go through all the details. Um, However, on the service side, that is especially for developers somewhat interesting. So we have this service called the Echo Service, which we use to test uh, things. And you have this traffic overview, which gives you uh, essentially a, a uh, well, not a real-time visualization. So it's not like these moving arrows represent how fast your traffic is flowing. But it means that when you are a developer and you're like wondering like, hey, uh, my service isn't working, you can very quickly just click on the tab and you can see if you maybe made an oopsie in your configuration and you don't uh, accept uh, consumer traffic. So that solves uh, like a whole bunch of problems because it used to be that you have to come to the platform team and you bug us on Slack and then maybe we wouldn't respond. So we come to our desk and then we wouldn't be at the desk because we were working at home. And you know, as a developer, that would be a very sad uh, situation. However, right now you just go here and you can see what's happening. Now, some other thing, uh, we generate uh, well-known names for every service. So what happens is during uh, your deployment, the Helm chart generates domain names. So when you're wondering what is your domain name, well, you just go into your desired manifest and it says it right here. It, uh, it gives you a bunch of hosts, so you know exactly what you need to type into your browser to get to your service. It also gives you the URLs that we support. And there's a little catch in there. So in the match line, I think that's line 26. Um, sorry, I keep moving away from the microphone. But line 26, um, that says, well, we match exactly on a URL with no slash. Um, and we also match on any URL that has a slash and something else which is zero characters or more. And you have to do both, because if you say, I want to match on just the name, and you then do a star, then you can essentially impersonate another service, because it doesn't have to be a slash that comes next. However, you also want to be able to reach your service if there's no slash, so you need to specify both. Now, this is automatically generated, so a developer doesn't need to specify it. We as a platform team did, so that they don't run into the same problem that we did. And you get your, 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 your ports, your destination, so your Kubernetes service in there as well. So as a developer, even if you didn't write all of the YAML yourself, you just to put two flags, a true and a false, uh, or a false in there, this is the result, which means that if you're just coding away, you're just committing some stuff, this gets handled for you. And it also gets handled for us by Istio, which is pretty cool. Um, so let's see, do we have more time? Probably not. I mean, there's usually someone with a sign. I think we're yeah, three minutes, yeah. So if there's any questions, uh, Maybe it's time for one question, otherwise, that's it. Any questions for John? All right. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, how many developers are you? You said you're a platform team of two, and you're kind of doing this abstraction layer to help the developers. So I was just wondering, like, how big is your development team, or how many developers you have? Uh, we have in total about 120 people in the tech department, and 100 of them are developers. We have a few support staff, a uh, couple of product owners. Developers are usually, and that's something that's uh, worked very well for us, and it probably also works well for very, very well for other companies. So our structure is essentially you have developers in the team. They do the technical stuff, but we also have product members in the team that are more on the business side, but they are uh, together in the same team, and they own the entire, from a business, uh, business perspective, the product. So that means that... Uh, you don't have uh, a department telling another department to build something. You have a small group of people with a shared manager and a shared product owner. Uh, and uh, usually it's like two developers, um, one product person, uh, and maybe someone who is somewhere in between. And they are responsible for maybe two, three services. Um, and yeah, you divide that, uh, you divide 100 developers over that, and then you know how many teams we have. Uh, so yeah, that's our, uh, that's our format. All right, let's have a big round of applause for John.